Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. So we have you here because MIT has chosen your book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, as our book that we're going to read all together um, as a faculty, as students, as staff. We're hoping that there are hundreds of people across MIT who are reading the book together this year. Um, and you're going to speak to a whole bunch of us this afternoon. Um, I was wondering, what do you most hope that a community like ours, an institution like ours, could get out of reading your book together? Well, let me say I'm honored that my book was selected. And I think that when I think about the content of my book, I always like to describe it in three parts. What, so what, and now what? Mm -hmm. And the what being what is racism? How does it operate in our environment? So what difference does that make in terms of how we think about ourselves and other people? That's the identity development piece of that. And the now what? What can we do about what can we do about it to collectively interrupt the cycle of racism in our society? So thinking in that framework, my hope is that reading it together will spark the kinds of conversations that ultimately will lead to not only deeper understanding of one another, but action toward interrupting what is a very destructive cycle of racism in our society. And what are some of the actions that you've seen other universities take or other schools take that have sort of studied the book together? What's, do, do any examples stand out at you of things you go, oh, sure. I'm so glad that this is something, this is a direction that this community went? Yeah. Well, one of the things that um, I talk a lot about in the book is the power of dialogue and the importance of it. So just the idea that reading the book, talking about it together is interrupting the silence that sometimes exists around racism, I think is an accomplishment in and of itself. But once we are really having those serious conversations, extended, sustained conversations, it often leads to greater empathy about the experiences, let's say, of, of students of color who are often marginalized by the um, undercurrent of racism in their environments and creating programs that are more supportive of them is one outcome. But I also think it really helps um, institutions think more critically about how to best educate the white students in their environment. Because if we are graduating white students who haven't really thought about what it means to be part of an inclusive community and a multiracial society, we haven't served them very well. And that was a big part of your entry into a lot of this. You were at Amherst and you taught a class called Psychology of Racism. Actually, for, it was at Mount Holyoke. At Mo yes, Mount Holyoke. Five college confusion on my part. No you were at Mount worries. Holyoke um, yes. teaching a class called Psychology of Racism. Um, what were what were some of the most challenging experiences that you had teaching that course? What were And what were some of the most rewarding experiences that you had teaching that course? Well, what was most rewarding was really just that, breaking the silence and having students think about what it means to be part of a multicultural society and what they themselves can do to interrupt the cycle of racism. One of the things that I uh, talked a lot about in that class and write about in my book is the fact that all of us has, a, each of us has a sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. Everyone, uh, we often think about leaders as, you know, the people who run organizations. But the fact of the matter is we're all leaders. Everyone influences other people to some degree. Teachers are leaders in their classroom. Parents are leaders at home. You know, many of us are leaders in the volunteer organizations that we're part of. And so what was most rewarding for me was for my students to really give serious thought to their own leadership capacity and to think about how they could use it. So at the end of every semester, I would ask students to develop an action plan. Mm. And those action plans might vary from leading an unlearning racism workshop in their residence hall to planning a family intervention at Thanksgiving, you know, to uh, doing a letter writing campaign about um, stereotypical advertising mm -hmm. or problematic messages in a favorite television program or thinking about how to diversify the curriculum. Um, going back to one's high school and meeting with one's favorite social studies teacher yeah. and talking about how more of what was being learned at the college level could be incorporated at the high school level. You know, lots of different ways of thinking about it, but I found that the hardest part about teaching about racism is the discouragement that comes from the persistence of the problem. Mm. You know, the fact that 20 years later, my book can be reissued to a whole new audience and people will say, you know, these issues are still with us. And they are. Yep. And yet at the same time, 
reminding ourselves through those action plans that change is possible. Are there so you you reissued a twentieth anniversary edition of the book in two thousand seventeen? Yes. Um, are there particular stories or are there particular conversations that you've had with people in the intervening years that have really reaffirmed for you why this is so important? Is there is there anything stuck out at you that sort of makes you go, oh, this was an example where I thought, yep, we we still need to be reading this, we still need to be talking about this. Well, in the book, there's a in the twentieth anniversary edition, the one that came out in twenty seventeen, there's a section called the prologue mm-hmm. in which I reflect on what's happened over the last 20 years. And when we think about that, we know that there's plenty to still think and work to change in our society. But when I've been on campuses talking to faculty members, staff members, um, some of them will say, I was a student 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I read that book when you wrote it in 1997. You know, it was part of my graduate school learning, or I was maybe I was an undergraduate. Fast forward 20 years, now I'm working here. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're working at their alma mater. I've come back, I'm here as a faculty member, I'm here as a staff member. And the same things that I experienced as an undergraduate, I see playing themselves out again. Now, here I am 20 years later. So in some ways, that's a discouraging story for someone to say, you know, 20 years, I'm back, and it's the same thing. We haven't really changed that much. But on the other hand, it speaks to why a new generation of readers uh, are finding this book helpful to them. And, and hopefully with 20 years more experience, hopefully they are in a position now, as you say, to take on some of those leadership roles, not not those formal leadership roles, not becoming assistant principal or dean of diversity initiatives, but saying me and whatever, whatever role I have in the school, it's my job to try to make our school a more welcoming environment, a more um, inclusive environment, an environment that's more affirming of students and so forth. All of the above, absolutely. One of the things that I think about, too, um, and I really started to think about this in 2018, Mm -hmm. um, following the release of my book, but in April of 2018, it was the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King. Mm -hmm. And he wrote his last book in 1968. It was published in 1968, and it's called Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? And when you read that book, reflecting on what he was thinking about in 1968, but reading it as I did in 2018, 50 years later, one of the things he talks about is the fact that the line of progress is never straight, Mm -hmm. that following every period of forward movement or progressive change, there's always a pushback against it. We might call it a backlash. Um, And... He was experiencing that in 1968, following things like the Voting Rights Act in 1965 and the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and the pushback that he felt in 1968. But when he is describing that, and you think about it through the lens of what we see today in 2019, you can see that over the last 20 years, there has been both progress and pushback. Yep. And I think we're in a period of pushback right now, right now. which positions us for forward motion yep. again. That's a wonderful, that's an, an incredibly wonderful, optimistic way of thinking about uh, the challenges of the particular moment. Um, one of the ways that I see even schools in the area trying to participate in that shift back to forward motion um, is to take issues of inclusion seriously in our schools. The Boston Public Schools this year has an initiative they describe around um, culturally and linguistically sustaining pedagogy, saying, mm-hmm. well, you know, there's 140 plus languages that are spoken in the Boston Public Schools. We have kids literally from all over the world. Um, it's now a majority minority district, so most of the kids in the district aren't white. Um, mm-hmm. How do we create a curriculum? How do we create an environment for all of our students that makes them feel welcome and included? I heard I was at a talk um, given by, the, I think, the principal and the assistant principal of the Hale School, one of our K-5 schools. Um, and the principal was talking about one recent interaction she had with a boy who said, you know, I, I'm just not that into cowboys. Um, and she said, yeah, but did you know that there were black cowboys? Um, did you know that it's not just people who are different from you, but people who, uh, well, I mean, people who, who are white, who look different from you, but there are also people who are African-Americans. There's a whole tradition of people who brought domestic animals to the West who are African-Americans playing that role. Um, and and seeing the boys uh, be both sort of light up and be sort of skeptical, like, come on, I've never seen a black cowboy, kind of what yes. are you talking about? Um, that was an 
example in the Hale School of one of the things that they were trying to do to say, you know, we just have to make sure that the books in our libraries and in our classrooms reflect um, the life experiences and the traditions of all the kids who are there. Um, if you had some of the principals um, who were taking on that initiative here, what kind of advice for, would you have for them about, uh, about making schools, you know, more welcoming and affirming places for lots of different kids? Well, I would probably talk about what I call the ABCs. A stands for affirming identity, mm -hmm. B stands for building community, and C stands for cultivating leadership. So to elaborate on that, the A is, of course, the most, I like to think of the A as the most important, mm -hmm. the starting place, the affirmation of identity. And it really goes back to the example that you were just using relative to that child and the cowboy incident. Um, the A, affirming identity, really speaks to the fact that everyone wants to be seen, heard, and understood. And how do we know we have been seen or heard or understood? When we see ourselves reflected in the environments around us, then we know that someone's noticed us, right? Mm -hmm. That we have been seen. And so, for example, um, I often use this as an analogy, and I think your listeners would appreciate this, but if we were all together in a room and someone took a group photo, mm -hmm. you know, the photographer took a picture of everybody in the room, told us to arrange ourselves and smile, and we got our picture taken, and a copy of that photo was given to each of us, the first thing any one of us would do when we got our copy would be to look for ourselves right. in that photo. Yep. You know, you look to say, okay, where am, where am I, I in this picture? And not only would you want to see yourself in the picture, but you would want to see yourself in the picture looking good, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you would be evaluating, how, was I smiling? Are my eyes open? Right. You know, right. how did that outfit look today? Um, and so if we think about the learning environment, the classroom, the school, as like a big photograph, we step into that photograph and we want to see ourselves in it. Mm -hmm. We want to see ourselves in the curriculum. We want to see ourselves standing in front of the room sometimes, if not all the time. Mm -hmm. um, we want to see ourselves uh, being recognized as part of this learning community in very tangible ways, in ways that white children regularly see themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't really have to think much about it because even if the teacher doesn't look like them, they're in the textbooks, they're in the reading room, library materials, they're everywhere. Yep. And so we have to be more intentional about making sure that kids are not invisible. Well, I want to make sure you get a chance to tell us about B and C too. But, yes. but drilling down on affirming, um, if I were to, I mean, so there's some things that teachers and educators can do to build a more affirming environment um, before kids are in the room. They can yes. think about what's on the walls. They Absolutely. can think about what's in their libraries. They can think about um, what materials am I, what topics are we choosing to delve more deeply into um, and knowing something about my kids and where they're from, how are, how are they going to see themselves in that? Right. Um, if I was in the classroom with a teacher who's doing a really good job of affirming identity do you have examples of sort of what moves I would see that teacher making or what kinds of things that teacher might be doing? What are the sort of actions, what are the behaviors that we can kind of cultivate in teachers that have that, that are characteristic of people who are really good at affirming? Well, let's imagine that the materials are there. Mm -hmm. Let's imagine there's a diversity of materials. And let's imagine that um, kids are being given some free choice time. And let's imagine you have a reluctant reader. And that you know, reluctant reader doesn't say, I don't, I'm not into cowboys. Maybe that reluctant reader says, yeah. I'm not into books. Yep. You know, I don't really like to read. Mm -hmm. And you might say to that person, well, you know, I know it's not your favorite thing, but I have a book that I think you might really be interested in. And then pulls out a book that does represent that kid in some meaningful way. Um, I had an experience of this mm -hmm. with a relative. I have two sons. My sons are four years apart, six and 10. Mm -hmm. At the time at that the this time. happened, <laughs> they're, they're now in their 30s, right? But um, they had cousins, two cousins, a similar age, six and 10. And so my two boys and their two male cousins came to visit. And they were spending several weeks with us in the summer. And um, the 10 year old said just that he wasn't into reading. My kids were voracious readers. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to get him to read. And he said, I don't like to read. And, and I, you know, he wasn't an excellent student. He was doing okay in school. But yep. um, but anyway, I said, well, I have some books you might be interested in. Let me just show you one. And I handed him a book 
Uh, the title of it was Wagon Wheels. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of your teachers listening might know this book, but it's about um, a black family after the end of the Civil War traveling west to settle in a what was a black community in Kansas, Nicodemus, mm-hmm. Kansas. And according to the story, it's based on a true story, actually. According to the story, um, the father, the mother, unfortunately, has died. And so the father is single parent with these two boys, and they're going out west to settle. And he is, it's it's very adventurous. And at a certain point, the father has to go ahead alone and leaves the oldest boy in charge of his younger brother. There might have been actually three boys, so Mm -hmm. uh, two younger siblings. And... They have to really survive on the trail out west. They have to survive on the trail out west, and it's quite an adventure, and they are very successful. They have some assistance from some local Indians, I think, that they meet up with. But but when I offered him this book, he was skeptical, but then he read it voraciously. And so the question we have to ask is, you know, are we engaging kids in a way that captures their imaginations and allows them to feel part of the story. And for us here at MIT, I think one of the things that we try to think about in our lab is not only doing that in the humanities, but where else does that fit in the science and technical yes. subjects? You know, that was why it was such a tremendous contribution, the movie Hidden Figures. I was says, just thinking it when you, you know, said th- that. that. There's this incredible history of African-American women, women in general, who are absolutely yes. central to the history of computer science and um, trying to, you know, both say, look, that, that conversation about power and race and identity are meant to be part of technical topics. I mean, yes. physics and chemistry and math and computer science, it's not just how we how we accomplish things, but it's realizing that these are things that are part of society. Absolutely. And the contributions, I mean, we, you know, we could go, and of course, right now we're talking about the um, missing information, the hidden figures, particularly mm-hmm. as it relates to African-American history in the United States. But similar stories could be shared about other underrepresented groups as well. And so that's the A. So mm-hmm. let's talk about the okay, B. Great. So the B is about building community. How do we create a sense of shared belonging? And the B and the A really go together. Mm -hmm. Because if we're doing activities in the classroom where some of the kids feel left out, feel invisible, feel marginalized, they don't actively participate. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to do around building that shared sense of community as a learning community um, only really works effectively if we have given some thought to the A. So I like to say B without the A doesn't work, Mm -hmm. right? So we, every, every learning community, every teacher, every school leader is thinking about how do we create a sense of belonging so that people are motivated and want to be part of this community. Sometimes they're reluctant to focus on the A because they think, well, if I really pay attention to the differences, I will somehow lead to... Make sp- things worse. Make Exactly. I will make things worse rather than bring people if together. We, if we don't talk about it, it's not a problem. Exactly. Exactly. But the fact of the matter is that... It may not be on your radar that it's a problem, but for the kid who feels invisible in that classroom, it already is a problem. problem, It already is a problem. So thinking about the B in the context of the A is the really critical thing. Mm -hmm. How do we think about um, what we're doing in new ways? And sometimes those new ways might mean creating a special club, particularly at the middle school level, you know, we might have uh, affinity groups. Some schools have them and have used them very effectively. Other schools worry that that's going to cause separation. But um, acknowledging the developmental needs of kids who are really thinking about their identity issues, particularly in early adolescence, can be an important part of building community. But it certainly extending identity and all the way community. through uh, through um, higher education. I mean, Absolutely. we have you know really powerful, effective. The Black Student Union here Absolutely. is an incredible group for organizing. But you know, both I think conversations with people about what does it mean to be an African American at MIT, which is a challenging thing given the limited number of faculty. Of, you know, we have amazing African American faculty yes, here, but, but we don't have as number. many of them as we. Would like, mm-hmm. um, and uh, as well as the programming that they can offer to the rest of the community to help us, um, you know, see what things look like through their eyes and through their perspectives. So through medical, medical middle school all the way up through uh, older ages, I think there's right. room for. Well, and then the C, cultivating leadership, is about helping all of our students, uh, whether they are underrepresented or part of the majority think about or develop the skills for connecting across lines of 
difference. What we know in today's society, it was true in 1997, it is still true in the 2017 version of my book, is that most of our students are growing up in relatively segregated communities. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence of that, particularly when they come to college or um, go into the military or, you know, go into the workplace, they find themselves in communities that are more diverse than the ones they grew up in. Mm -hmm. Those who come into higher education have a unique opportunity to to have direct contact with people they didn't have direct contact with in their elementary, right. middle, even high school sometimes. And, and so it means that there's an opportunity to learn some new things. But if we don't take full advantage of that opportunity, then it is lost and perhaps won't be replicated again unless we really use it to its fullest benefit here at institutions like MIT. When the question, um, why do all the black kids sit together in a cafeteria? One of the things it evokes for me, um, uh, so I was a young white teacher when I finished in college. I went and I taught in high school. Um, uh-huh. I actually taught in a school that was organized, a real, or it was a high school around a really long hallway. Um, and there were five alcoves. So the freshmen uh-huh. had an alcove and the sophomores had an alcove, the juniors and the seniors. And there was one alcove in the middle that was called the black alcove. Uh-huh. Um, and this was a place where African-American and eventually Latino students um, would congregate. Um, regardless of grade year? Uh, yeah, regardless of grade year. So obviously, yeah. there, you know, and yeah. there's sometimes there are white kids who are sitting in the black alcove. And sometimes yeah. there, are, you know, there are African American kids who are sitting with the sophomores because they were yeah. sophomores. Um, but it was a distinctive feature of school life. And I've thought, I thought a lot at the time, and I thought, uh, I've thought a lot since, especially rereading your book um, about walking by the alcove. So when when the black kids are sitting together in the cafeteria, or in my case, when black kids are sitting together in the alcove, um, how do you? What are some of the most productive ways that white teachers can walk by, can be near that space? Is the thing to do to like leave them alone and to do their thing? Like how you know um, when the black kids are sitting together in the cafeteria, um, there's there's what what can white teachers do sort of in that moment in interactions with the black kids sitting together that build upon the ABCs as you describe them? Well, the first thing I think to acknowledge is the value that can come from gathering with students or having a shared experience. Mm-hmm. So when I wrote my book back in 1997, the first version of it, um, and titled it Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race, it was in part because of my experience working as a consultant, sometimes coming to do professional development right. in in schools that were majority white but had a significant population of black students, enough for them to be sitting together in the cafeteria, people would always ask me that question, and they would ask it as though they were concerned that it was a problem. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria, and what can we do to make them stop? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it was like that kind of a question. Mm -hmm. And, And so part of what I talk about in the book is the value that can come from sitting together with people with with whom you have some shared sense of identity, particularly when you're a teenager and actively beginning to explore that identity. Mm-hmm. So, so I, so I want to say it's a perfectly fine question to ask, but let's not assume it's a problem. Right, right. That said, it is also important for students and teachers to learn how to connect across lines of difference. And so, I often say, let's worry less about who's sitting where during the break times Mm -hmm. and think about what's happening inside the classroom. Mm. You know, so are there opportunities inside the classroom to help kids navigate um, those differences? Social psychology tells us that the best way to build cross, positive cross-racial relationships is to give a group a task where they're working together toward a shared goal, Mm -hmm. where they've come together on equal footing, and where that cooperative, collaborative behavior is sanctioned by an adult in authority. So a teacher at the front of the classroom can put kids in mixed groups, can have them working on projects together, can give them opportunities to really get to know each other on a uh, level playing field relative to the task that they've been asked to do. Sports teams are an example yep. of this, of course where the coach is supporting the cross-group in- engagement. But when you give um, kids those opportunities, that activity often spills over into the classroom yeah. or into the alcoves. And the teacher who is seen as an ally 
um, as someone who authentically cares about, knows me, knows my name, uh, talks to me about my interests, engages me in conversation inside the classroom is likely to be the teacher that I'm going to spontaneously speak to yep. when they pass by me on the hall. Yeah, the bu- building those relationships in classroom, being attentive. I, I mean, I remember in my in my third year of teaching, part, part of what shaped my experience there was I taught a class called Race in America uh-huh. um, as, a, as a social studies elective. Yes. Very sadly, that year it was only African-American and Latino kids who signed up for the class, uh-huh. although I'm glad to say the following year there were a more diverse group of folks who signed yeah. up. Um, but the experience of building more relationships as a teacher there. I remember, I remember, be, you know, being more deliberate my third year of like walking more slowly by the Black Elk Cove and, and thinking to myself, like, if they're having a good time, I'm not going to do anything. But I want them to see that I'm looking at them. I want them yeah. to see, like if I see some kind of like like they want to wave and say, hey, Mr. Reich, hey, Coach Reich, or if they uh-huh. if they want to reach out, I want to be there for them. And then if they want me to just keep walking by because they're doing something else, I want to sort of yeah. leave them alone. But trying to be intentional about just as you say, sort of being, you know, making sure that they knew how much I cared about them and mm-hmm. their success and that I was there for them. And if they yes. didn't want me, I was going to keep going about my business. Yes. But, you know, sort of slowing my stride just a little bit so they knew that, like, I, you know, I see you and I'm here if you need me. Yeah. Yeah. It's not unlike, you know, a parent-child relationship mm. in adolescence. You know, there are times when your teenagers want to talk to you and sometimes they sometimes don't. Sometimes they don't. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it's just being available. So if they do, they will. Right. What do you think are the hardest scenarios that teachers have to navigate? And this, this is a segment we'll call Do My Job For Me. Um, uh-huh. So one of the things that we try to do in our lab is to create opportunities for people to practice difficult situations. Yes. Um, and so whether, you know, through simulations or other kinds of things, we sort of create these moments where teachers have to have to tackle particularly challenging moments in teaching. Um, if you were creating some of those situations, what would, what would be ones that you would sort of put together to kind of provoke, you know, particularly for new teachers or particularly for white teachers, kind of challenging interactions that you wish teachers on average would be able to do better than they currently do? In general, I would say to teachers, don't be afraid to talk about race. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that's easier said than done. Um, And one of the things that I found when I was doing a lot of professional development um, in the greater Boston area, I was often working with white teachers Almost all of the teaching staff, particularly in suburban communities, yeah. is white. And but yet these were teachers who were working with kids from the Boston area who were bused into their communities through what is known as the METCO program. Right. And of course, listeners in the Boston area will know that that's a voluntary desegregation program that's been in place probably close to 50 years right. now. Yep. Um, But one of the things that I found was that teachers, white teachers in particular, struggled with giving honest feedback Mm. to students of color, Mm -hmm. um, particularly adolescents, because their fear was that either this kid or the kid's parent would perceive their negative feedback, or I'm going to call it critical feedback, um, as somehow being racially motivated. Mm -hmm. You know, like you're picking on my kid, you're not, you don't like my kid, you're giving my, you're telling my kid isn't doing what he needs to do in your class because you are, quote, a racist. Right. And I once asked a teacher what would it feel like if someone said that to her. And she said, I would feel like I've been punched in the stomach. Mm. You know, that it would be a really visceral response because no one wants to be labeled with that R word. Right. You know, and, and because of that, because of that fear, Unfortunately, it was leading to some very unproductive behavior, as in not giving the feedback. Right. You know, so let's say you've got, you know, Michael in your class and Michael has not been getting his homework done and hasn't been turning it in. And you need Michael to do that in order to be successful in your class. And yet you're hesitant to either give Michael that honest feedback, you know, if you don't turn it in you're going to really suffer the consequence in terms of your academic performance, or you don't want to call Michael's mother or his father to talk to him, uh, talk to them about Michael's performance for fear that somehow your critique of Michael will be misunderstood. If you withhold that information, 
then in some ways you are being discriminatory because you're giving that information to Tommy, the kid in yep. this, you know, the suburban white family. Uh, his Who parents, needs that and can use that to get better, yes, but Michael's ex- not getting it. Exactly. So we were having this conversation talking about this very problem, and the teacher was c- expressing, and she was not alone in this feeling mm-hmm. of just how painful this would be. So we talked about, well, let's imagine that happens. Let's imagine you have some concerns about Michael's performance, not just his homework, maybe his attitude. You know, you've got some things you want to share with Michael's parents, and Michael's parents accuse you of being racist. What would you do? Yeah. And she talked about how she would be very just paralyzed by that. And But let's imagine the first response, perhaps, is to defend oneself. Yeah. Of course I'm not, you know, not a prejudice bone in my body. Right. I don't even see race. I don't see color. Yes, exactly. That is not a useful response. But what would be a useful response? The response that I tell teachers is to ask for more information. Mm. You know, what if someone said, well, I think that was really a racist response. Help me understand that. Why did you think that? You know, what was it that I said or did that gave you that impression? You're asking for more information. And usually the person on the other end responds with surprise because they're expecting the defensive right. response. You know, but if you say, you know, that was not my intention. Can you help me understand what I did that was that left you with that impression? That's the opening for a dialogue, which can then be very productive. Mm-hmm. And there may be ways that teachers can even like literally practice some of those, you know, practice some of those hard yes. moments and and say, well, what what did, you know, what could I do more? I mean, it's probably it's probably somewhat challenging to ask that question to a parent. It's uh, of what what do you feel like I did that was racist? It's probably even more challenging to ask that to a sixteen year old or a seventeen year old and say, no, yeah. no, no, really, honestly, I just want to hear from you. I'm I'm not I'm not trying to ask this in an accusatory way. Just what was it that I did that made you feel like I was racist? Because I want to know because that's, you know, that's not what I'm trying to do. Or Well, and I found that um, when working with teachers, when they did ask that question and they asked it sincerely, they often learned things that they weren't even aware of. You know, I'll give a common example on a high school situation where one kid has raised his hand and asked for the pass to go to the restroom Mm -hmm. and gets the pass and goes and comes back and another kid asks for that pass and either he told to wait or takes the pass and is criticized for being gone too long. Yep. And s- someone in that room is timing. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, Probably say, not the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Someone in that room is can come back and say, well, you know, when John went, I was looking at my watch. He was gone two minutes. Mm-hmm. You know, when Jamal went, he wasn't gone more than two minutes either. But you said something, Jamal, you didn't say anything to John. You know, Jamal's absence was noticed more than John's absence was. Um, so that is part of the conversation. But being open to the conversation, getting over the fear of even having it is really important. One of the things that I did a research project a long time ago, uh, which turned into a book of a different title. Uh, That book is called Assimilation Blues, Black Families in a White Community. Mm -hmm. And I was interviewing parents about their experiences in their children's schools. Black parents were living in a predominantly white community where their kids were often sometimes the only black kid in the class, one of few. And one father said it really bothered him when teachers said they treated all the kids the same. And his response to that was always the same as what? Mm -hmm. You know, um, the same as though they're all white. They're not all white. You know, my kid is having a different experience in this school than the white kids are having. If for no other reason, then he's not seeing himself represented in the curriculum. And so being willing to acknowledge that not all the kids are having the same experience and that they're is a context in which we're all operating, Mm -hmm. a context which reinforces messages about the, uh, what I'm going to call a hierarchy of human value, yeah. you know, where some groups are valued more highly than other groups. And if we don't acknowledge that, we can't fix it. And if we can't talk about it, we can't fix it. If we can't talk about it, we can't fix it. Yes. And so that, I think, is something that teachers can practice with each other um, in a supportive way if they're willing to do that. When... Some of the organizations that I worked with are, for instance, Facing History in Ourselves, yeah, mm-hmm. um, an amazing organization I know that, all about it. that works with teachers around identity. Um, and they both 
are giving teachers tools to talk about identity and helping support them talk about their identity. And there is a sort of, you know, background constant fear talking about the Holocaust, talking about Reconstruction, that teachers are going to talk about this in ways that are harmful to students, that they're going to, you know, that everyone's, I mean, the classic sort of Holocaust example is what, like what people do simulations yeah. of, tra- and, you know, just things that make you go, oh my gosh, I can't believe that you would think that would be okay. Yes. Um, as you as you encourage teachers to have more conversations about race, are there any things that particularly worry you of like, have more conversations about race, but, but not like that. That's yes. not what I meant. Yeah. Well, I think it is really important to create um, a community of practice so that you can get feedback. Mm. Um, You know, we all make mistakes and I started teaching my first class on racism. I taught that class for the first time when I was 26 years old uh, in 1980, and I certainly made mistakes. So I always like to say, if we wait for perfection, we will never get started. Yeah. So we know mistakes are going to happen. But if you have a community of peers that you're regularly talking to, you can get feedback, you can get better. If you make a mistake in class, you can come back next week and say, class, you know, we were doing this thing and I said something I wish I hadn't said or I did something that I'm not sure was that helpful and so I really want to see if we can revisit that today because mm-hmm. I've been thinking about it. There are ways to kind of correct one's errors in real time that um, students appreciate. That said, there's no, um, there's nothing better than being able to have real-time feedback from peers who are also working with these issues. And there are schools that create those learning groups that read things together, that talk to each other about these issues, and I think that helps. I mean, that's such great, concrete, actionable advice. Sort of have conversations about race. Be ready to have those conversations about race. Do it with a community of peers so that there are people checking about the things that you're trying to do, that you're bouncing ideas off each yes. other. This is what I'm going to do for the next couple of weeks, and it's going to be new. How does this sound? Yes. Um, and then being willing to recognize that you'll make some mistakes, to acknowledge those mistakes, and to um, and to go Go back to your students and say, I don't think that was what I meant to do. I think I did that wrong. Can we, you know, can we have a do over? Can we talk about why I don't think that was right? Or you're already telling me why I don't think that's right. And I want you to know that I heard it. Um, Those sound like great actionable things to be able to do. Well, Dr. Tatum, this has been an incredibly productive and rewarding conversation. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me.